Welcome St. John's. Today, we conclude our series on looking at women in the Bible, and we will recap the stories of the women we have heard and see how it broadens our image of God. But before we get started, here are a few announcements. Coming this fall, we have a bunch of gathering opportunities starting. Beginning in September, we will have two midweek gathering options for you. One is a group that will gather to reflect on the sermon and the scripture every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. There will be an in-person group as well as one meeting on Zoom. The other one is our downtime meditation, and that happens every first and third Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. It's a time to slow down and pause in the middle of your week. And also during worship, we'll be offering Kids Corner, where kids grade K through five will be able to gather in the fireside room for a story and an activity. And we're looking for volunteers to help out. So it's really simple. And this is a great way to just get involved. And we continue to offer other gatherings like our 20s and 30s that meet every first Monday of the month, as well as Theology on Tap that meets every third Thursday of the month. Lastly, mark your calendars for September 30th. We are bringing back our ukulele and hula fundraiser. We will be raising money that will go towards accompanying families St. John's is supporting through the immigration process, such as housing and legal fees and anything else that might come up. And thank you for your ongoing generosity, your support of St. John's. There are just many ways to give, whether it is online or mailing a check, but your generosity makes a difference. We'll be sharing all the ways that your financial support does so in serving our community. Also, if you haven't done so yet, please put in a prayer request. We would love to pray with you and know that there is a prayer team supporting and committed to praying for you throughout the week. And just know if you want to join the prayer team, simply uh, let us know and sign up. It is as simple as receiving a weekly email um, of all the prayers that have come through. And now let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, to open ourselves to the word of God. Let us worship God. Today's scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke. Listen to today's word. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. 
Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. John Walter had a difficult time growing up. As a kid, he got bullied at the playground, and he never had a lot of friends. It didn't stop him from trying to fit in, though. In ninth grade, he decided to go to the aqueduct, where all the popular kids hung out. And when he arrived, he could hear people whispering, what's that guy doing here? It was always a mystery to why no one gave him a chance and wrote him off at first sight. Then one day, he had an epiphany. For his summer job, he had to take a photo, a photo ID. Looking at it, he wondered, why do I look so weird? Is this how people really see me? Because this isn't how I see myself. The guy in the picture looks shy and timid, but when I look in the mirror, I think I look pretty cool. And then it dawned on him. It's his hair part. When John looked in the mirror, he saw a guy that parted his hair from right to left, but he realized that what people saw was a guy who parted his hair from left to right. The problem was that he liked the guy in the mirror and not so much the guy in the photo ID, the guy who everyone saw. What he realized was that he was the only person that saw this cool guy in the mirror, so he decided to swap his hair part. Later that night, he went out to test his new theory. So with his new hair part, he went back to the aqueduct, went up to the same people, and not only did they treat him like he was cool, but they recognized and acknowledged him. Now, to illustrate his point, here's a picture of Abraham Lincoln and how the world saw him. Now, if we flip the picture, we will see the way Abraham would see himself in the mirror. Compare the two and see how different they look. Now, whether you can see a difference or not, this experience changed the way John saw himself as well, as how people saw him. He wanted to share his experience with others and created what he called a true self mirror. It's basically two mirrors set up at a 90 degree angle and placed in a box that when you look at yourself in the mirror, the mirror flips your reflection so that what you see is what the world sees when they look at you. John calls this your true self. John would take these mirrors to festivals and gatherings to give people an opportunity to see themselves in a way that they hadn't before. And afterwards, he would invite them to comment on what they saw. And the reactions were mixed. Some reacted in fear, shock, and intrigue. And for some, it was just too revealing. And one even commented, I am a monster in your mirror. And there was a small percentage that liked what they saw for the first time in their life but the majority seemed to not be able to handle the true image reflected back at them. Today, we conclude our month-long journey of looking at women in the Bible. We first looked at Eve, often named as the first woman and helper to Adam and responsible for the fall of humanity and the reason why there is sin and suffering in the world. And instead, 
we consider that maybe Eve is the first to do a free act of conscious personal choice, to see the world, see the world and God and herself clearly in all its good and evil. Next, we looked at Jezebel, often depicted as the worst human ever, and while her behavior cannot be justified, we did look closer in how her actions compared to those of Queen Esther and King David, who were also not innocent in similar atrocities, and yet are held in such high regard. We also looked at women who go unnamed, like the Canaanite woman, who stood up to Jesus and the disciples to demand a healing for her daughter. That even Jesus needed a wake-up call, a wake-up moment, and learned what great faith looks like. And even though we looked at more feminine images of God through these stories, I hope what opened up in us is a curiosity to look deeper into all the stories of God so that we can discover the true image of who God is. I hope that what we found is that our faith is not anchored in a God that is male or female or any gender for that matter, but that God is reflected in us and we are reflected in God. If that is true, then isn't it crucial that what we see reflected is something that we embrace rather than reject. If, like the true self mirror, we can see ourselves reflected in God, then isn't it vital that we expand and broaden our names for God rather than force one singular image and name? To me, that doesn't honor God, but it puts God in a very narrow theological box. By studying how feminist theologians have poked holes in the interpretations of the Bible, I hope that it gives all of us, no matter what gender, race, citizenship, and status, to do so as well. So yes, we can affirm that God is the Yahweh, Alpha and Omega, Counselor, Mighty God, I Am, Prince of Peace, Father, Creator, Shepherd, Christ, Messiah, Emmanuel, the Word, Holy One, King, Servant, Friend, Savior, Yahweh, and El Shaddai. In fact, all the passages in Genesis that use El Shaddai are connected to fertility blessings. That when God made God's covenant with Abraham, God says to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us and I will give you many, many descendants. And it doesn't stop here. There are also so many stories where God is also named as mother, but not just one kind of mother. In these stories, God is named as mother bear, mother eagle, comforting mother, nursing mother, woman in labor, mother hen, mother bird. God is also identified as woman, seamstress, washerwoman, baker, and wisdom Sophia. Even in today's story, God is named as a woman who lost a coin. God is described as a woman who earned 10 drachmas, which represents 10 days of labor. When she loses one of those coins, a day's worth of wages, she lights the lamps, takes a broom, and frantically sweeps the entire house. Now this is where it gets interesting, because when she finds it, she doesn't just find relief. She throws a party, she wants all of her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her that what was lost was found. This means that God, the holy woman of the lost coin, goes to great lengths to find what is lost because she knows the value of what was lost. She's not wealthy and therefore can't risk that the coin will show up on its own. This coin was what was needed to remain sheltered or feed her household. If this coin remains lost, she and her family would suffer. Isn't that true for us, that we can often see how the economy impacts the whole of us globally when prices go up? I mean, we see that every Saturday, how the number of neighbors grow who need fresh and healthy groceries. New Testament professor Mitzi Smith says, if we cannot see our lostness as connected with the lostness of others, we will work less diligently 
for a quality of life, justice, and love for others. And that's why when the coin is found, the holy woman of the lost coin throws a party, for she is a communal God that extravagantly throws a celebration for all to welcome and receive what was lost. Just like how her community would be affected if the coin wasn't found, the community will be there to celebrate when it is found. When you look around, when you see on the, the, the diverse walks of life, isn't it understandable how one image and one name of God doesn't suffice to fully encompass who God is, and more importantly, our relationship with God. There's this wonderful children's book by Rabbi Sandy Eisenberg Sasso called In God's Name. And it's a story of how the people of the world set out to find God's name. Each of them is sure that they found the right and only name for God. Then one day, they all came together and knelt by a lake that was clear and quiet like a mirror, God's mirror. And it says, then each person who had a name for God looked at the others who had a different name. They looked into God's mirror and saw their own faces and the faces of all the others. And they called out their names for God, source of life, creator of light, shepherd, maker of peace, my rock, healer, redeemer, ancient one, comforter, mother, father, friend, all at the same time. Then all at once, their voice came together and they called God one. The woman who lost a coin is one of my favorite images of God. I think it's because it is the image that I can most relate to. Having grown up as a Korean American in a time when the belief was to assimilate as fast as possible to the American ideal, or as a woman in the church in a time when the belief was that women couldn't preach or lead, my identity was lost. And I am so grateful that I didn't give up like the holy woman of the lost coin to find and discover who I am, knowing that I am ever changing. I'm grateful that I am surrounded by family, friends, and a church community that celebrates with me my gifts and reflects back to me a truer image of who God is. I think that is why having children right smack dab in the middle of our worship space is so important to me. And trust me, I know. Trust me, I know that it can be distracting and loud and even messy. I mean, it's not perfect and by any means, there is still room to do better. But what I hope they know is they aren't lost. They aren't swept aside, shushed or ignored. That they are beautiful reflections of not only who God is, but who we are. I, we, can't guarantee that they will ever not feel lost as they go about life, but I hope what they can carry with them is a memory of being known, accepted, celebrated, and loved. We should all have that in our back pocket, a memory of being known, accepted, celebrated, and loved. And if we don't, then I hope we can start building that here and now. Here in this place, it should be a safe, open, and real place for us to see our truer selves. And when we do, not respond with, I am a monster, but like John Walters, see the beauty and celebrate in being fearfully and wonderfully made. So take a moment to consider what your names for God are. How does that reflect or resonate with you and who you are? And what images are challenging and why? And can we celebrate with one another? Because the party's already started. What was lost has been found. I can't think of a better reason to celebrate than that. Amen. Please join me in prayer as we consider other ways we name God. God is not rescuer. God is not safety. God is not benevolent or critical father knows best. God is not puppet or puppeteer. God is not who I thought was taught he is. God is lover, reckless, spendthrift, indiscriminate journey, passionate. God is pursuer, relentless, determined, tireless seeker of my soul. God is challenger, demanding, movement, journey, change, growth. 
God is creator, delighted in me, her creation. God is nurturer, nursing her hungry children. God is teacher, eager to share her knowledge and wisdom. God is dancer and music maker, creation responds joyfully to her choreography. God is spirit, wind and fire. Uncontainable, she will not tolerate the tidy boxes we painstakingly construct for her. God is light, exposing, revealing, searching out all that I would hide. God is unknowable, yet constantly revealing herself to me with a richness and intensity I cannot ignore. God knows me, penetrates me, informs me, recognizes and claims me as she has from my mother's womb. And now know that the all-knowing God in whatever name that you have for him, her, or they is with you as you go throughout this week, learning to love your neighbor, learning to love yourself and ever discovering all the beauty that God has created. Go in peace.